Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, our virtual federal election public forum, hosted and produced by TradesNL. TradesNL is an umbrella labor organization that promotes and coordinates the interests of 16 building and construction trade unions across Newfoundland and Labrador, representing more than 18,000 tradespeople who are working to build prosperity in our province. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Darren King, and I'm the executive director of TradesNL, and I'll be your moderator for today's forum. Before we introduce today's event and our guests, we'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we present this event is on the ancestral homelands of the Beothic. We also acknowledge the island of Uktaumkuk as the unceded traditional territory of Beothic and Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional ancestral homelands of the Innu and the Inuit. I'd like to offer, first of all, a special thanks to all of our attendees who registered for today's event, many of whom are members of our building trade unions and work hard in our industry to support their families and their communities. Our hope is that the event will provide some insight into how you can make a difference in the upcoming federal election, how each federal candidate and their respective party values the interests and issues tradespeople face in our province, and we hope that it will equip you with the information necessary to make an informed decision in the upcoming September 20th election. So by way of some housekeeping, today's event is a live question and answer forum. And for the benefit of all of you, here's how things will work. The order of the opening and closing statements was determined by a random selection facilitated by staff here at TradesNL. As a moderator, I will present a question and candidates will be given equally time limits of one minute to present their answers. As a moderator, I may have to interject if any candidate extends beyond the time limit. So for that reason, we kindly ask uh, to the extent that you possibly can to respect the one minute time limit for your answers. We are going to start the questions in alphabetical order by party name, and then candidates will then take turns responding first to the, to the corresponding questions that follow. Questions may also be asked by chat box, uh, through chat box by attendees, and if time permits, we'll present these to the candidates. If time does not allow, then we've committed that we will certainly forward the questions along to the candidates post this forum. So with that said, I offer a warm welcome to each of the federal election candidates who are here today to participate in the live Q&A on behalf of their party. Representing the Conservative Party is Matthew Chapman, the Liberal Party is Seamus O'Regan, and of course the New Democratic Party is Mary Shortall. Thank you all, welcome to you all, I should say, and thank you all for agreeing to participate. We certainly participated Excuse me. We certainly appreciate you being here and look forward to what you have to say. So with that being said, uh, we're going to get started. We're going to ask each candidate to take a couple of minutes to have a, an opening statement. And as I said, we'll start, first of all, with, uh, with the Conservative Party, Mr. Chapman, please. Hi, uh, thank you, Darren, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today to discuss the issues important to tradespeople and construction workers in Newfoundland and Labrador. We know tradespeople and construction workers are essential to the economy of this province. You are the economic engine of our communities. When trades and construction jobs are up, everyone benefits. The future of trades and construction workers in this province is anything but secure. Now more than ever, we need voices for common sense, people who will be heard in Ottawa and who will provide the leadership we need to secure the future at home. This province is blessed with an abundance of natural resources that can provide the jobs necessary for a strong economy and the revenues needed for our healthcare, roads, education and transition to a greener economy. We have tremendous potential in mining and in particular with oil and gas mega projects, but currently many of those opportunities are delayed, indefinitely deferred or canceled. Only Canada's Conservatives are committed to seeing all sectors and all regions thrive and we have a plan to make it happen. Canada's recovery plan is focused on creating opportunity. Our plan takes immediate action to help those in the hardest hit sectors like energy and resource development, and it helps those who have suffered the most over the last 18 months. Our leader, Aaron O'Toole, is the only party leader in Ottawa standing up for workers because he knows resource development creates good paying jobs that are necessary to help all Canadians and their families prosper. I'm looking forward to answering your questions put forward today. And once again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Uh, Mr. O'Regan, you're next, please. There we go. 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's been a heck of a past 18, 19 months, there's no question about it, uh, not only for this province, but for the entire country, and most particularly for our oil and gas industry, which uh, I think most people on this call would know uh, oil and gas alone takes up about 50% of the royalties, of the revenues, total revenues to the province. Getting some stability for workers in this industry uh, and in other industries that were affected by COVID was a huge priority for us coming a year ago. And we were building on a position of strength when it came to the offshore. Um, one of the biggest beefs I heard from industry and from workers was that uh, environmental assessments took so long on exploration wells. We reduced those from 900 days when we got into office to 90. Uh, we moved the environmental assessment office here so that the people here, uh, so that the people in that office who were making those decisions, more of them were from here and understood what was happening on the ground here. Um, and then we, we worked on a $2.5 billion uh, agreement with the province on the Atlantic Accord Renewal Agreement. That was our position going into COVID. Coming out of COVID, particularly on the offshore, uh, we got $400 million for workers and for uh, lowering emissions. And lowering emissions is really key. It's not just because uh, it's the right thing to do and the proper thing to do for the future of our children and our grandchildren. It's the future of the industry. I can tell you that from the front lines, having dealt with this as Minister of Natural Resources for the past two years, it is a fact. It is a fact that all of these oil companies are dealing with, and we have an opportunity in this province to be way ahead, not just on oil and gas, but on energy overall. The future for this province and the future for our natural resources industry and for the workers involved in that industry is bright, is bright indeed. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And Ms. Shortall, please. Thank you, and I want to thank you, Darren, and Trades NL for organizing this event this afternoon, and also for the work you do on behalf of your members, uh, many of whom are also members of the Newfoundland Labrador Federation of Labor. How you highlight them at every opportunity, and especially uh, the work you do to advance more women and Indigenous people in trades, thank you for that work. I've been involved in workers' struggles for around 40 years. And when I first got involved with my union, I realized that the struggle for workers' rights goes far beyond the workplace, that even the best agreements that you can negotiate can be wiped out by the swipe of a legislature's pen. Unions can't leave politics alone because quite frankly, politics won't leave unions alone. So political action is not only necessary, but we know it works. Workers and their families are the backbone, uh, a backbone of a vibrant society. And when workers do well, the communities where they live, work and play do well, and so does our economy. And as much as we can celebrate the victories that have led to improved working and living conditions, we also know that too many workers face barriers of inequality and injustice at work and in all aspects of society and our economy. So it's important that we talk about those challenges. The resources of Newfoundland and Labrador belong to the people of this province, and the people must always be the primary beneficiaries. We know that. Government finances will always be precarious in a volatile, resource-based economy, and we need to talk about that as we discuss real economic recovery. The NDP is committed to ensuring our economic recovery is worker-centered and that we can succeed in a low-carbon future. Our party has always stood up for workers' rights, workers' safety, good, decent jobs, and support for families and communities. Think about NDP input in the West Stray Bill, for example, the Marine Atlantic ferry rate increases, offshore occupational health and safety regulations, to name a few. St. John's East has been well served by having an NDP voice in Ottawa, because just having a voice like all the others at the table does not always mean your concerns will be raised and dealt with. Skilled trades and construction workers in our province have highly technical, transferable skills that we can and must harness. We are committed to ensuring that bold public investments are directed to clean energy, climate resilience, physical and social infrastructure, building communities with energy efficient retrofits, affordable accessible homes, making more products here at home, investing in our care economy so our loved ones are looked after, reforming EI when we need it, protecting workers in their unions, and ensuring decent, fair, safe work as we strengthen our communities, fight the climate crisis and build a strong economy of the future. We'll pair this with new access to training and education and targeted support for impacted workers and communities. 
So I look forward now to spending some time and uh, telling you about how we can do that together throughout the forum. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate that. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump into our questions. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thanks to uh, a number of our members actually submitted questions when they registered for the event. Uh, and they're all, I just wanna say, they're all incorporated into what we're going to ask you. The language may not sound the same as what our members submitted to us, but they, they cover the same topics. So the first question, uh, uh, Mr. Chapman will be the first to respond, followed by Mr. O'Regan and Ms. Shortall. Uh, so the first question will be no stranger to either of you, I'm sure. You're probably tired of hearing me talk about it on the radio, but the topic is benefit agreements. So the objective of benefit agreements is to support the continued development of both a qualified and diverse workforce and drive the local economy by creating good paying jobs. We believe at Trades and L that benefits agreements should be mandatory on all publicly funded infrastructure projects where there will be provisions in the agreement that will prioritize local hiring, uh, hiring of apprentices, females and other represented groups, as well as workforce development provisions. So the question is to uh, Mr. Chapman first, what is your parity position on benefits agreements, sometimes known as community benefits agreements across Canada? And will a government that you are a part of require benefit agreements on federally funded public infrastructure projects? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador has a world-class trades workforce. You know, projects like Hebron were done on time, on budget, and to incredible occupational health and safety standards. The Conservative Party is committed to ensuring local projects create maximum local benefits for local workers, apprentices, Indigenous workers, tradeswomen, and other underrepresented uh, workers. We understand local projects allow workers to go home at night and not only create jobs for tradespeople and construction workers, but it also creates opportunity for office and support staff and local businesses and restaurants. The Conservative Party recognizes the best value for a project is not the lowest bidder. We need to optimize investments to build both infrastructure and the people the infrastructure is there to serve. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reagan, please. Never sure who's taking me off mute or if it's me or you. Um, thanks, Darren. You look, I, I mean, I, this harkens right back to when I worked as an executive assistant to Edward Roberts back in the day. Now that was on a Hibernia technology transfer. This has always been something that, uh, you know, benefits agreements aren't new to Newfoundland and Labrador. They've been instrumental in creating uh, all sorts of jobs for the people of this province on various mega projects. I worked firsthand on the impact benefits agreement when I worked for Brian Tobin uh, for Voices Bay. Um, and frankly, that for uh, the way it is, we've worked with Indigenous people, both the Inuit and the Inuit there. Frankly, it's the gold standard. It's an evergreen document, but we keep it up. And so we've got these in place for Hibernia, for Terra Nova, for Boise Bay. I know that the Premier has an aggressive plan to build infrastructure, to develop uh, resources. And, and we know that the potential of the province, we know we can be leaders in things like hydrogen, clean fuels, offshore wind. This is just, it's awesome stuff, but we got to make sure that we're diligent and vigilant and making sure that the benefits accrue in all ways, shapes, and forms to people here um, and that local residents and apprentices and indigenous workers and tradesmen and women will benefit. So I promise to be vigilant on that and I'll work with the premier to develop and implement an overall provincial Newfoundland and Labrador benefits policy. Thank you very much, Ms. Shortle. Thank you. The NDP has long supported mandatory community benefit agreements and project labor agreements on all publicly funded projects. Uh, the federal Liberal government uh, has uh, often passed up the opportunity to generate employment and training opportunities on every federal funded project, instead creating the Community Employment Benefit Framework that invites contractors to set up and report on targets. Unsurprisingly, this has failed to move the needle in terms of apprenticeships, diversity and inclusion, and bringing disadvantaged youth into the trades. By using community benefit agreements, we'll guarantee that good jobs, training, apprenticeships, and support for local workers and businesses are part of every infrastructure project. The NDP will require community benefit agreements to be negotiated with the trades and require specified apprenticeship, employment, and training opportunities as a condition of the funding. And all stakeholders need to be at this table, workers, industry, indigenous communities, communities, and all levels of government. And that way we'll begin to change the status quo and transform apprenticeship and training provision in our province and in Canada more generally. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to question two, and we're going to start with Mr. Reagan this time, followed by Ms. Shortall and Mr. Chapman. So the, the question is around stimulant infrastructure spending. And as many people are aware, according to the La Canadian Labour Congress, we've gone through with COVID probably one of the, the worst unemployment crisis that we've seen in the country in some time, uh, with nearly 35,000 people in Newfoundland and Labrador being identified as being unemployed. And many of those are from the construction industry. While most other provinces are somewhat booming in construction in particular, I can't speak for other sectors, but in construction in particular, most, most other provinces outside of Alberta are doing extremely well. Newfoundland, Labrador continues to struggle with a sluggish economy and delayed or canceled oil and gas projects in particular. History has shown that construction activity is one of the greatest economic stimulators available, it puts people to work, puts money back in their pockets, and it gets money circulating through the economy. Uh, with that as well, we were aware that every construction job created probably creates anywhere from seven to nine spin-off jobs. So the question is, what is your party position on federal infrastructure spending in Newfoundland to create construction jobs and to stimulate the economy once we get through the next election? Thanks, Darren. Um, first of all, I would say, you know, some very good news late just recently on Terranova and, uh, and on Terranova, that was uh, money that we were able to provide through the federal fund last year that was to, there to support workers and there to support lowering emissions. Um, that I think will be, you know, tremendous stimulus back again, although, you know, one could argue that it is something that was in danger that we had kind of wouldn't say we took Terranova for granted, but it was a concern. It's good to see it's back on track. I'm hoping for good news on, on West White Rose as well, but we'll see. Um, you know, that's, that really depends on the investments that come in, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, we've got other projects like the Fixed Link where we put out, you know, we've asked for a call for proposals. Um, and I, you know, that's kind of been under the radar, but that could be an absolutely seminal project for this province, to be honest with you. So just keep your eye on that. And on the Atlantic Loop, we're not going to make a fortune off it at the outset, but it is very important. It is a nation building opportunity in order to lower emissions, particularly for the maritime provinces and get them off coal. I would say, look, 2016, we launched the Investing in Canada plan. That's $180 billion in infrastructure spending over 12 years. Uh, in five years, we have already invested $96 billion of that in over 73,000 projects. We created the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which is working with us on the fixed link. Um, and we've seeded it with another 35 billion to help get important public projects built. We're not finished yet. A lot more to do on that front, but I am very hopeful and we've put our money where it is. Good, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Shortall, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, physical and social infrastructure spending has been very near and dear to my heart always, especially as we talk about economic recovery. Uh, but it's also at the center of an NDP plan to respond to climate change and meet social needs. Uh, and the NDP plan says that we will partner with the province to invest in infrastructure that will make a real difference in Newfoundland and not just putting billions towards an infrastructure bank that has not completed a project since it was started in 2017. We'll work with provinces to put in place a new deal for rural infrastructure programs as well. And that provides long-term predictable funding for communities and uh, will also help build high-speed broadband and cell phone infrastructure that's uh, badly needed in this province. We'll create a Northern Infrastructure Fund, which will fast track investment and focus on improving much needed infrastructure like roads and broadband internet again for communities in Labrador. And we will create a million jobs by putting people to work, building up our communities with climate, resilient energy, transportation infrastructure, and modern communications infrastructure, and the bricks and mortar needed to expand social infrastructure in our communities and make sure that every province gets their proportionate share of that. Uh, we'll expand federal funding to respond to disasters and support communities in, in proactively adapting their infrastructure to withstand the floods, the forest fires, and all those extreme weather events that we're seeing. And we'll use Canadian government infrastructure procurement to support Canada's manufacturing economy, requiring the use of Canadian-made steel and aluminum for those projects across the country and here in Newfoundland Labrador, and avoid negotiating trade deals that put domestic procurement policies at risk. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Mr. Chapman, to you, please. Great. Uh, thank you. So infrastructure projects are critical to creating job 
jobs in construction, as you said, Darren, uh, especially now at a time when many tradespeople in our province are without work. Canada's Conservatives will create construction jobs by immediately investing in critical projects that will cut commute time and clean up the environment. We will scrap, scrap the failed Canada Infrastructure Bank and commit the money sitting unused to projects to create immediate construction jobs. We will continue already committed projects and reprioritize the Investing in Canada plan towards infrastructure projects that would have the maximum benefit for economic recovery. And we will also reduce bureaucratic red tape in the application process so money can get out the door faster to where it's needed. One example is by removing the liberal requirement that funding only be awarded uh, for green infrastructure. This requirement is slowing down major economic projects like roads and airports, and will give more flexibility to municipalities and First Nations. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. We're moving on to question three. I'm going to start with Ms. Shorto, followed by Mr. Chapman and Mr. O'Regan. So the topic here is resource development incentives. Currently, as all of you would be keenly aware, Newfoundland and Labrador has a lengthy list of oil and gas and mining, mining projects that are either on hold, deferred, or canceled, while the oil and gas mining industries traditionally contribute up to 30% of our provincial GDP. It's our view, and I think a shared view by many in public, that we can no longer wait and see if investors and projects will return. We need immediate action to get projects moving and construction workers back on their tools. If we do not participate in exploration in particular, we will not reap the benefits of development. So the question is, how will a government that you are a part of incentivize exploration and development so that investors are attracted to our region? Let me short off. Uh, thanks. We actually have to go beyond simple tax incentives and subsidies to attract investment to the Atlantic region and to our province. Instead, we need to incentivize long-term commitments to the region by working with the provincial government, local communities and companies to offer a secure and constant supply infrastructure, high quality skills and public services. Um, rooting investment in the region means creating long-term conditions for a balanced, diversified economic development and industrial diversification, not throwing money at corporations in the hopes that they'll stick around when competing regions offer their own incentive packages. It really is about making sure that a program supports workers and families and communities and it stays in the province. In the past, we've seen too many governments try to lure investment by giving companies massive tax breaks and a pass on workplace standards and a pass on environmental regulation instead of creating the broad-based condition, uh, conditions for long-term value creation. This is a recipe for fly-by-night investments purely dependent on commodity swings, continued government subsidies and relaxed regulations, which is not does not bode well for the workers of the province. A new democratic government will develop comprehensive industrial strategies to incubate and expand critical domestic manufacturing capacity and supply chain infrastructure and partner with the province to invest in infrastructure projects that will make a real difference uh, to the workers and to the people of this province. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chapman, please. Well, only, I think it's obvious by now that only Canada's Conservatives will actually expand resource development in this project. You know, since the Liberals have formed government, we've seen over $160 billion in investment for resource projects to leave Canada, and that was before COVID-19. And, six, and since COVID-19, uh, Newfoundland's offshore has been decimated with project deferments, delays, and cancellation. One reason we are losing opportunities is because we are not financially competitive. To address this, Canada's Conservatives will support Newfoundland and Labrador's offshore oil industry by investing $1.5 billion in an offshore rebound fund to spur the continued growth and expansion of the offshore industry. We will also create the Canada Investment Accelerator, a 5% investment tax credit for any capital investment made between 2022 and 2023. Conservatives have had heard the call for help over the last 18 months, and these incentives will finally get workers working again now while creating long-term opportunities in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. O'Regan, please. You can, you can incent, but you got to make sure the capital is drawn. You got to make sure that people will invest. Uh, let me tell you something. 
May 26 was a day that uh, I'll never forget because you had a shareholder revolt at ExxonMobil, you had a shareholder revolt at Chevron, and Royal Dutch Shell in the Netherlands was told that they aren't doing nearly enough to lower emissions. That is the future of this industry, and we got to get with it. Good news is we've already come a long way, to be honest with you. If you want to incent further, you know, uh, you want to send our offshore, you've got to make sure that people understand that we're serious about lowering emissions. And that's because that's what investors are looking for right now. It's plain and simple. The good news, we have a low emitting product in, in Hibernia, and we have a low emitting product in Hebron, and that's good news for us. Um, when we got into power, we were told by Noya and other organizations and by industry that, you know, for whatever reason, the conservatives have decided to up the amount of time for an environmental assessment for an exploration well from 300 and some odd days to 900. It tripled it and didn't do anything further for the environment. We took it from 900 days to 90 days. We put an environmental assessment office here in the province. Um, contrary to what Mr. Chadman's saying, there has been no government, frankly, since that of Mr. Crosby that has done more for the offshore. Plain and simple. And we've got the right incentives in place in terms of time. It puts us on a level playing field with Norway and the UK. But let me tell you, they over there as well are looking long and hard at their exploration incentives and the reputations of their jurisdictions in order to continue to draw investment. Investment is drawn to those who lower emissions. Okay, thank you uh, uh, very much. We're moving right along here, moving into question four. I just wanna offer a, a reminder to everyone that uh, try to keep within your one minute time frame if you possibly can. And I fully understand where you are. I've been in your situation, so I know it's tough. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the person that likes to moderate and cut you off. So I just a little friendly reminder for everyone that if you could, when you see me kind of moving, you know, you're around about your minute or so, okay? Uh, but anyway, it's not to take away from your quality of your answers or anything like that, because we really do appreciate the preparation you put into this and, uh, and look forward to the rest of the questions. So I want to move on now to question four, and we're going to start with Mr. Chapman, followed by Mr. O'Regan and Ms. Shortall. Um, the topic is called Maximizing Construction Jobs from Resource Projects. So uh, again, you probably heard me talk about this a little bit, but we're seeing a, a concerning trend here in the province with our major resource projects over the last number of years, where a fair amount of construction is going not only out of the province, but it's going out of the country completely. Uh, by way of a couple of examples, the uh, White, West White Rose project that we're currently working on in Argentia, the top sides are being constructed in Ingleside, Texas. The Combachant Narrow Refinery, prior to the, the recent sale that we're going through, had an extensive coker project plan that was going to be constructed in China. The Beta Nord project, uh, we're not completely sure where that is, but all the indications are that a bulk of that work is going to be done in Asia. And um, while the Terra Nova FPSO is getting some work done here in the province, there's a fair amount of the refit work we're told by Suncor that are actually, is actually going to be done in Spain, work that could be done here. So the question is, if elected, how will your party's government ensure that resource projects are developed so that the maximum number of construction jobs are created right here in Newfoundland and Labrador and Canada for the benefit of Newfoundlanders, Labradorians and Canadians? Great question, uh, Darren. Uh, Canada's Conservatives will maximize construction jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador by putting forth an internationally competitive regulatory regime. Investment in natural resource development is an expensive commitment. Before billions of dollars are allocated for a project, decision, decision makers need regulatory certainty and the confidence projects won't be indefinitely delayed. The Conservative government will fix the impact assessment process created by Bill 69 basing our changes on the bipartisan recommendations made by the Senate Committee on Energy, the Environment, and Natural Resources. We will also eliminate unneeded and counterproductive red tape in an industry, in industry, while also working to improve the system to achieve greater emission reductions. We will ensure carbon leakage does not occur as a result of resources developed in jurisdictions with lower environmental standards, we need to restore Canada's reputation as a safe place to invest and create jobs, and a Conservative government will ensure that happens. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reagan, please. Yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm looking forward to maximizing the number of construction jobs by maximizing the number, the amount of development, the kind of new development that we can see here in this province, because, uh, you know, I get sick of just cleaning up the mess of the guy before me. Um, you know, like 900 days to, to get an exploration well done was absolutely ludicrous. Uh, and then you'd have to redo the whole process 
if you did an exploration well 10k away from the first one. It made absolutely no sense. So, you know, cleaning up that mess to make sure that we have the right incentives in place is one way that you're going to draw in your investment to make sure that you maximize the number of jobs. But I'm looking at new things that we could be doing. Look, the Clean Fuels Fund, we've, that's $1.5 billion that we've launched. Um, it's going to help refiners like come by chance right now looking at you know, low carbon diesel, emissions free jet fuel coming from cooking oil. They're already using it on flights from uh, Air France flights from, from Paris to Montreal. We can be leaders in renewable technology. By God, if we can't figure out offshore wind, who can? That is a huge opportunity for us. And with the amount of uh, hydroelectricity that we will have in this province, uh, with Muskrat Online, we can start using that in order to generate green hydrogen as well. We've got to broaden the pie. We've got to look bigger at other things that we could be doing in this province, and we've got to skate to where the puck is going. That's where it's going. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shortle. Hi, uh, responsible resource development will always be essential to the economic development in our province, but we can't continue to send that work outside because we have the people and the skills to keep a lot of that there. That's just not acceptable. We have to find ways around that. Nor can we make the transition to a more environmentally sustainable economy without the new construction materials, manufacturing and energy sources that come from resource development. And those are the workers of this province who can do that. But we need a plan. We can't have workers who are scared about their jobs every time something happens, go to Confederation Building to demonstrate and to rally. I mean, you've been there, I've been there. Uh, that's not a plan. A new democratic government will create over a million new jobs in all communities and rebuild local economies with meaningful family sustaining work in every province of the country, but especially here in Newfoundland and Labrador. It'll include jobs in energy efficient retrofits, affordable housing, renewable energy, infrastructure, transit, uh, and much more. But we need to ensure that the people of the province maintain the maximum benefit from the development of their resources, including the use of local employment. We'll prioritize strategic resource development projects that are tied to our overarching goals of good job creation, economic development that diversifies the local industrial base, environmental transition, and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Our next. My apologies. Thank you for your answers. Our next question, we're going to start with Mr. O'Regan and then go to Ms. Shortle and Mr. Chapman. The topic here is the green economy. So Building Trades members recognize and support measures to transition Canada to a net zero economy and want to play a lead role in building Canada's green future. This will mean, however, significant changes to the construction industry and the skill sets required by trades workers. To work through this transition, adequate supports will need to be put in place to support skilled trades workers, including retooling and retraining, as well as transitioning construction and energy workers. So my question is, please describe the approach your government would take to ensure the appropriate actions are taken to support the current skilled trades workforce through this transition. Mr. O'Regan. Thanks, Darren. I was down at Trades NL when I announced our national just transitions consultations that are beginning um, and that have, already, that have already begun. I have been serious in wanting to work with uh, union leadership in order to make sure that we are on the right path and that we're doing it together. Um, that is the approach that we've had um, throughout this, actually throughout COVID, but also particularly how we've dealt with things here. And that's you know, how I will continue to do things as we transition. This is significant. What we're going through is significant and it's global. Got to stop thinking it's just happening with us. It is all over the world. It is affecting investment. It is affecting our energy industry all around the world. So we got to stay on top of it. And let me tell you, um, the most creative ideas that I've had, uh, that I've received, I should say, from right across the country have been from unions. Uh, I have dealt hand in glove with, with workers and with union leadership right across the country. And as one fellow said to me in, in Alberta uh, when I was out there when we could still travel, he said, uh, you know, I don't care if uh, as a crane operator, I'm lifting a pipeline or I'm lifting a wind turbine. But good work is good work. We got to get serious about just transition. We've begun those consultations because we can't do it unless we do that together and set up that legislation. We've already started with a $2 billion futures fund for Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and Labrador, designed with local workers, with unions, and Indigenous people to support regional economic diversification. We're serious. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Shortle. 
Just transition is a really important topic, and uh, I know I've been talking about that in, in my former uh, role and, and my current role uh, for some time now, because we all know that there's uh, no jobs on a dead planet and that we need to transition workers away from, uh, from jobs that are, are not jobs of the future into those new jobs. And it's really important. The, the Liberal government signed on to the Paris Agreement in 2015, which put a commitment towards um, how, we, how we go forward with a robust just transition plan that was mandated. Uh, during that, there's been a task force around workers in the coal industry that have made very serious recommendations to government in 2019, but we're still behind the eight ball. We have to sit down now. It, it's not a matter of if this is going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. And we need to sit down uh, right now with unions, with workers, with industry, with communities, with indigenous peoples, all those who are impacted. We need to talk about the labor skills that we need, what type of jobs are we talking about? We have huge uh, capabilities here with hydroelectricity, uh, with all kinds of green jobs, with uh, the plan to move into uh, infrastructure and all those things that are going to create a greener economy. But we need workers need to feel that they can keep food on the table for their families, that they don't have to be scared all the time about losing decent jobs that will maintain that through a plan. It has to happen now. It's the most important next step for any government in power. Thank you for your perspective, Mr. Chapman. Uh, great question and an important topic. You know, there's no question that climate change is real. And when we discuss the future of workers, we need to acknowledge that developing our resources to the higher standards and transitioning to a greener economy are not mutually exclusive. We can and we should do both because the world will still need our resources for decades to come. As leader Aaron O'Toole has stated, Canada should position ourselves as the resource provider for the democratic world. But that doesn't mean we don't transition or create new opportunities. Canada's recovery plan calls for a liquefied natural gas or LNG export strategy to help reduce the use of coal globally. We will also implement a hydrogen strat energy strategy that rapidly increases the use of hydrogen in Canada and builds our export capacity. Many of the skills, technology and production protocols developed in oil and gas are transferable to hydrogen. Conservatives will also create the Working Canadian Training Loan to provide low interest loans for people who want to upgrade their skills, empowering workers to determine what training they need. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, question six, we'll start with Ms. Shortle, then Mr. Chapman, and Mr. Reagan. So over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, Newfoundland has had the distinct pleasure of leading the country with the number of female trades workers. Um, we maxed out, I think at one point, somewhere between 14 and 15%. With projects finishing up, mega projects finishing up in the province. Um, and as a result, the benefits agreements tied to those projects, we've now seen numbers that are less than half of that, below 7% of our trade workforce right now being uh, female. So my question is, what is your party position on women in the trades? What actions would your party's government take to ensure women and other underrepresented groups, or workers, sorry, are provided with opportunities to work on federally funded infrastructure projects? Uh, Ms. Shortle. Thanks for that question. And that again is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, both inside and outside my political work. Uh, it's really important. I think that we support the uh, initiatives and I know the NDP does of the whole country's building trades to expand access to the trades and bring more women especially, but also youth and indigenous people and other workers from equity seeking groups into the trade. That means we need to have education and outreach initiatives that uh, need to be expanded. And we also need more funding for prior learning assessment and recognition 
pre-apprenticeship training programs, more apprenticeship sponsors, support for apprentices to complete their apprentices and the ratios and benefit agreements have to be tied together. They need to be mandated in any federally funded project as a condition of any type of agreement or any type of discussion around apprenticeship. Uh, it also has to be paired with new access to training and education for young workers and for women to be able to enter the workforce and to be targeted support. And we need to ensure that the changing economy works for those impacted workers. Um, and that means we need to invest that money into the just transition with those conditions in there as well. Equality, we always have to put a gender lens on everything we're talking about. And, and Trades NL have done a magnificent job of that. The other issue that I will bring up is that nearly 300,000 women in our country are not in the workforce because they don't have access to childcare. So it's not only about how we negotiate benefit agreements and how we uh, put the mandates into those federally funded projects, but we also have to invest in quality, affordable, not-for-profit childcare for everyone, no matter where they live, and support more options for women to build careers in the trades and other non-traditional fields like agriculture, innovation, research, and STEM. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chapman. Um, conservatives have long stressed the importance of promoting careers in the skilled trades, and we will continue to encourage more women, youth, and Indigenous peoples to choose this career path. Conservatives will also combat the stigma that surrounds skilled trade work, especially in construction. We had to do a better job of talking to students, and especially women, to let them know about the rewarding, well-paid careers available in trades. The lack of skilled tradespeople in construction in the construction industry is, is very problematic. In addition to changing the perception surrounding skilled trade employment opportunities, the Conservative government will offer financial assistance to new workers by doubling the apprenticeship job creation tax credit for the next three years to help more places for apprentices, uh, investing $250 million over two years to create the Canada Job Training Fund, and giving laid off workers immediate access to training and help them get the skills they need with a focus on the areas where there are shortages of skilled workers. And with regards uh, to getting more women particularly involved, as uh, Mary Mishortle uh, pointed out on, on childcare, the Conservatives did release our childcare plan today. And it's all about flexibility to allow uh, uh, women and, and parents the, uh, the flexibility to offer the child care that, that they need, that they see fit for their family. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reagan, please. Yeah, the amount of money that we're offering to put forward on, uh, on child care is significant and it will be bringing down the amount of, uh, for child care in this province down to $10 a day. And I think Mary uh, is absolutely right to point out that, you know, beyond the, beyond the agreements themselves and beyond any sort of IBM, you know, portions that we can put into an IVA that, that, that focus on gender and GBA plus. Um, it's, 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 it's across society. When we can make significant changes like that on childcare, that could be one of the biggest things that we will do, not only for trades in Allen for this province, but right across the country for women. It is significant because what we've seen in this is, as we recover, is that it was a she session that we're getting out of. We are losing women uh, in the workforce. And when you lose women, you lose the best. You lose the best and you lose the most talented. Um, projects, uh, companies are not attracting, the unions are not attracting the best people if women are left behind. So we just can't allow that to happen. Um, we are, to get specific, we're doubling the trade union, uh, or union training and innovation program to $50 million. And that's gonna support more apprenticeship training and additional partnerships in the Red Seals trades right across Canada, target more participation from women, also from indigenous people, which I'm particularly passionate about, and uh, as well as persons with disabilities. I think that's really important in order to make sure that we continue to attract the most talented people. Thank you very much. Our next question, we'll start with Mr. Chapman, Mr. Reagan, Ms. Shorto, and you've kind of touched on some of this, each of you, in a couple of questions, but I want to talk for a moment just about our Indigenous participation. So Newfoundland and Labrador has an abundance of resources and opportunities for development, particularly as we look at what we've seen in Labrador over the last 20 years. There's been many examples of what we believe to be missed opportunities for our Indigenous employment and workforce development. 
So my question is, what is your party position on Indigenous participation in the skilled trades workforce in the construction industry? And what actions will a government that you were a part of take to ensure that we recruit, retain, and advance Indigenous skilled trades workers so that they become not only tradespersons, but leaders on construction sites into the future? I'm going to start with Mr. Chapman. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Darren. Um, well, we have to emphasize that, you know, conservatives are the only federal party that wants to see our natural resource development expand. And that includes for, for all workers, including Indigenous peoples. Um, our leader, Aaron O'Toole, has been very forthright and open about getting, um, working with Indigenous leaders at the table, collaborative having them not only getting jobs, but taking equity stakes and ownership in the resources that are developed. And uh, by doing that, we can move forward on, on a real path towards um, uh, reconciliation. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Regan. First of all, I mean, I got to take on this whole thing about you know, the conservatives are the only party that are interested in expanding natural resources. I mean, come on. I mean, that's what this country was built on, and that will be the future of this country. But what's up for contention, perhaps, is how we go about it. And how we go about it, frankly, and making sure that we lower emissions and that we pay attention to the consequences to the planet of what we do. What I'm saying is, and I've known this from the past two years, is that's just not like the nice thing to do, the right thing to do, or the thing that, you know, is going to not kill our planet. Uh, it is the smart business investment. It is the way that investment is going. That is so important. Um, and listen, I, I have worked on impact benefits agreements with the Inuit and the Inu at the beginning of Oises Bay. I can tell you, you know, as I said before, those were those are evergreen documents, which means they continue to evolve and we continue to tweak them. But I'm very proud of the fact that they are frankly the gold standard in, in this country. And we could point to them as being very real and offering very real opportunities to Inu and Inuit businesses. Uh, up in up in Labrador. We got to continue to do more of that. And I can tell you, frankly, there is no way you are going to develop natural resources in this country without indigenous participation. I don't know how many times we got to go to the courts with it. We're the ones who said, okay, enough of that. We got to figure out a better process in order to make sure that indigenous people are part of the process so that good projects continue to get built in this country. They cannot, indigenous people will not be ignored in this country. They must be part of the process meaningfully and they must benefit meaningfully. Thank you very much. And over to Ms. Shortall, please. Thank you. Just like we have to put a gender lens on uh, everything we negotiate, we also need to put an Indigenous lens or an equity lens on those things. And you cannot talk about projects, especially if we're developing hydroelectricity or, or we're trying to find uh, ways of creating uh, new jobs for your members. We can't talk about that. Uh, we definitely can't give money to those projects as a federal government without having those conversations with the Innu Nation, for example, uh, with any Indigenous peoples. And uh, so they are uh, absolutely important stakeholders that need to be at the table without a doubt. But beyond that, the same way we need to provide uh, extra attention to getting more women in the trades and apprenticeship ratios and all that, we need to do the same thing with indigenous people. And they are uh, a big part of our communities, big part of our province and need to have special attention when we're, when we're putting those things into place. Uh, I've said it before that you can't create equality by treating people the same. We achieve equality by treating people different and we're going to have to put those different measures in place to make sure that they become full participants uh, like women and like other equity groups. But on land uh, where we're looking to uh, exploit the, the resources on land that's occupied by indigenous peoples, we absolutely need to have them at the table before any federal money or any projects are developed on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, on to our question eight. Uh, we'll start with Mr. O'Regan, followed by Ms. Shortall and Mr. Chapman. Our topic is workforce development. Our country and our province is experiencing an aging workforce, projecting the need for up to 6,200 new skilled trades workers here in Newfoundland and Labrador over the next 10 years. 
How will you work with your party and your government, should you win, to attract new entrants into the skilled trades and what incentives would you offer? Mr. Reagan, please. Let me begin by saying that uh, this is an absolutely essential subject because uh, as I've said time and again, I am incredibly proud of what our workers have managed to achieve uh, in our natural resources sector, but I would point particularly to what we've managed to achieve in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador. In two generations, we've become the fourth biggest producer of oil and gas in the world. In two generations, because we figured out how to get oil out of sand. And the head of ExxonMobil here in Canada, you know, has pointed to our offshore as the harshest environment in which ExxonMobil operates in in the world. We did that. And our expertise is sought after all around the world. So getting this right is essential because we cannot lose our workers as we get on to something that is very urgent for this province, for the industry, and for the planet, and that is lowering emissions, wherever we can find them, whenever we can find them. Because as I'd said time and again, who the heck do you think is gonna lower the emissions? We can't afford to lose good workers. I've laid out some of the specifics that we're doing on Red Seals trades. I will point to the fact that we're, we're pledging $2 billion for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and our province, because we recognize that lowering emissions here is, is going to be absolutely essential to our economies and therefore to the economy of the country. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shortle. Um, I kind of answered that question when we talked about how we uh, attract more women and, and, and First Nations and Indigenous peoples. That's, uh, that's basically the same type of, uh, of, of process, right? We have to support the initiatives to expand access to bring in more people, youth, Indigenous people and workers. And that's through education and outreach, you know, apprenticeship ratios and community benefit agreements that, that I'll talk about that. But the other big issue in our province in particular is that we're losing a lot of young people outside the province and we're not focused on uh, the labor market needs of the future because we're still reacting to things that are happening presently. So you can't, all those things that we talked about to encourage more people and more incentives to bring people into the skilled trades are really important, but also so are strong public services, are the other issues that uh, like a pharmacare program, Medicare program, education issues that and make sure that people can afford to stay here and to study here into the skilled trades and they become um, workers in the province. That's also very, very important as we move forward. So it's, it's about making sure that we have those incentives that uh, that are force other workers to be incentivized, but it's also making sure that we have the social and infrastructure in place so that people want to move here and stay here and study here and work here. Thank you very much. And the final on this one goes to Mr. Chapman, please. Um, yeah, before I get to your question, I, ju I just want to point out that, you know, Mr. O'Regan loses all kinds of credibility when we look at the number of projects with indigenous partnerships and ownerships that have been canceled without consultation over the last six years. Um, but moving on to answer your question, you know, the, the issue facing Newfoundland and Labrador today is that we are, face, we, ha, we are facing a declining population. It's the lack of good paying jobs. It's the cost of living here that is driving our young people away from this province. So by developing our resources, by getting, uh, by creating those good paying jobs, we will help keep our younger people here. And how we do that? Well, likewise, I already uh, mentioned this in some of the, uh, in, in the other question, but uh, you know, doubling the apprenticeship job creation tax credit for the next three years, uh, investing $250 million over two years to create the Canada Job Training Fund, and making sure that you know laid off workers do get access to training um, with focus on uh, areas where there are shortages of skilled workers. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, believe it or not, we're close to the end here. Uh, we committed an hour and we're going to try and stick to that because I know you guys, all of you are really busy and you need to get out and see some other people. Uh, so before I have a few concluding remarks, we're now going to turn it back to uh, each of you. Uh, and we're going to do it in the following order, Ms. Shortall, uh, Mr. Chapman, and then finally Mr. O'Regan, and uh, offer a couple of minutes for you to kind of wrap things up or pull things together or 
really the time is yours, however you'd like to, uh, to spend it. So if you would, we'll start with uh, Ms. Shortall, please. Uh, thank you again, Darren, for this very important forum. Um, as a labor leader, I pushed hard, and I believe uh, we made significant gains for workers over the years in occupational health and safety laws and regulations, workers' compensation, protection, improved labor legislation, issues that matter to workers and their families. Many of those issues are important for the NDP as well, and that's why I've been a member of this party for four decades, because the NDP has been fighting for policies, laws, and programs that all workers need. And these have been um, unacceptably underfunded for many years, and uh, need, that needs to change. And I'm prepared to put the same hard work, passion, energy, and commitment into being a voice in the party that puts people before profits, that puts people before corporations, uh, just like Jack Harris did, because the NDP has workers' backs. A survey was released last week that said that 77% of skilled trades workers have experienced work shortages in their areas. 65% had to travel more than 150 kilometers from their permanent residence for work opportunities over the last five years. And that's meant that some of them had to decline work, imagine, as we went through this pandemic because they just couldn't afford it. So workers in this province are rightly concerned about losing decent jobs. If there is no plan to address that, no plan to address climate action, and if the programs that protect them are not available to them. Uh, if we're serious about transitioning to a sustainable future, we need to build a future that's not only sustainable in the ecological sense, but in the social one too, and ensures that all workers and workplaces impacted by our shift to a greener economy can transition into sustainable jobs. Uh, the executive director of the Canada's Building Trades Union says that federal government needs to ensure adequate supports are put in place to support skilled trades workers, including a just transition plan now for no matter when in the future we will need them, because it really is about when and not if. Newfoundland Labrador needs its fair share, not just for workers, but for all of us in the province. And it's not okay that we still don't have a plan moving forward. Successive governments have let us down both on transition planning for impacted workers, but also for not having a plan already around hydroelectricity, wind, tidal, solar energy, and other initiatives that would also ensure that your members get plenty of work. And it's not okay that government says they are giving our money to oil companies when it, in fact it's our own money from our own resources that are being used to prop up multinational corporations and not protecting the workers. We need to do better than that. We also need to improve our EI system, negotiate strong community benefits, give more support to apprentices, ensure all workers have access to good jobs, and especially those from marginalized communities, and to create jobs that give decent, fair, and safe work to workers. We need to push for accountability and for action on all those promises that have not been fulfilled yet. And you know that's what you'll get from me. I've done that my whole life. I've stood on the steps of Confederation Building and supported workers and against harmful government decisions. I've stood on the step of the parliament in Ottawa and did the same thing. And I know I can be that same voice in the House of Commons representing a party that actually has workers' backs. That I can promise you. And I wanna thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much as well. Uh, Mr. Chapman. Well, you know, Canada is at a critical crossroads and the path we take is going to determine the future of this province and the people who call it home. Conservatives proudly support resource development in this province, especially the oil and gas sector that is critical to so many people on this call. On May 26th, not a single Newfoundland and Labrador MP supported motion M61, support of oil and gas sector. The reason why is simple. The Liberals do not support responsible resource development. Only Canada's Conservatives do. The Liberals will point to the Hibernia dividend, the support for workers, the return of our own money, but that came months too late for many of you. It also had a significant string attached. It could not be used for financial incentives to encourage expansion. In other words, the money couldn't be used to grow the offshore industry to create new projects, which would create new jobs and return to consistent and long-term work for trades and all members. The NDP leader was here two weeks ago and said no to future resource development, 
without giving any insights into how we replace thousands of jobs or billions in future revenues. The Trudeau Liberals have openly attacked our resource sector, calling for a reimagined economy, prematurely transitioning resource workers, and phasing out entire industries. Only Canada's Conservatives envision a future where natural resources, construction, and trades are bolstered, where wages go up, and where the dream so many families have of being able to afford a better life for their children can be realized. To achieve those dreams, we must have a competent government that champions Canadian workers by getting projects built in Canada again. And that is exactly what Canada's recovery plan and an Aaron O'Toole-led Conservative government will deliver. Thank you so much for your time today, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. And finally, last word to Mr. Reagan, please. Listen, the, the lines that Mr. Chapman are, are reading from, I mean, they may have worked in the 2015 campaign or they may have worked in the 29 campaign. Everything has changed. Climate change is real. It's affecting our energy and natural resource industries right around the world. And we either stick our heads in the sand about it, as the government before us did, or you get with it. That's the best thing we can do in order to make sure that our natural resources continue to develop and that we support the workers who are in, who actually develop those resources. As I've said before, I am extremely proud of the relationship that I have with the unions right across this country, and particularly here locally, whether I've been dealing with Line 5 or Line 3, whether I've been dealing with TMX, which is under construction, um, whether I'm dealing with the offshore. The first people I call are union leadership. They are the first people I call. They are the ones with the most creative answers and the best solutions, and they are the ones who are actually going to get the job done. This is absolutely imperative. And I agree actually with Mr. Chavin on that. We are at a pivotal point. There is no question. But you either skate to where the puck is going or you're not in the game. And we got to make sure that we lower emissions. One of my proudest moments, I got to say, as a, as a Canadian, but particularly as Newfoundlander and Labrador, just know that it was our legislature, the House of Assembly, where unanimously every party and every member got up to say that they were in favor of net zero by 2050. That was hugely important and a great signal to send, not just to the rest of the country, but to the entire world, that we are on the ball here. And we are. We've got an extremely, extremely bright future, but we've got to make sure that we react the way that the markets are reacting. Climate change is real. And if we want to make sure that we continue a, 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 an optimistic and beneficial future here in this province, worker-led, then we've got to make sure that we escape to where the puck is going. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Regan, and a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to all of those or sorry, attendees who joined into the session today. We've had a, an overwhelming response, so people tuned in to hear what you had to say and to hear about the issues, hear directly from you on behalf of your own candidacy and your party, um, and hear about issues that are important to, to us here at Trades NL and to others in the province as well. Um, and I would remind uh, those who are online that uh, you can check out our website, tradesnl.com. Uh, we do have an election toolkit there where you can find other information around the issues that we've been advocating for. I um, certainly encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, finally, to the candidates, each of you, thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate you joining in. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. Uh, there's times I like to be out there with you. I know what it's like on the campaign trail, and it's a lot of fun. So. Um, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us, and I know on behalf of all of our group here, um, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see you. Um, we have a wealth of knowledge here around our council table, so whomever of you are successful, hopefully you'll all be successful in whatever way that is. Uh, we're here after September the 20th to work with you and do the best that we can to support you. And to everybody else out there, thanks once again, and make sure you get out and vote and exercise your democratic responsibility. So thank you all very much, and best of luck to each of you.